Hi, I'm Ron Matson, and welcome to Learn the Bible in 24 Hours with Dr. Chuck Missler. Chuck will be taking you through some interesting oversights of the Bible and showing you some amazing facts. For more information on how you can join this group, click here. Well, we're now going to enter hour 14 of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours as we begin our study of the New Testament. And uh, as we do that, um, we have uh, a whole other uh, perspective to, to gain here. The, the, the uh, New Testament has architectural features that are very similar to the Old. The Old Testament opened with the five books of Moses, and the New Testament opens with five historical books, the Gospels and the book of Acts. And you can look at the book of Acts as volume two of Luke, if you will. See, Luke wrote two books, Luke volume one and Luke volume two, if you will. So I always treat the four Gospels and the book of Acts as a group. Then we're fo They are followed then by 21 interpretive letters. Just as the book of Deuteronomy is, is Moses' interpretation of the law, there are really three sermons by Moses, in the New Testament we have 21 letters that were gathered and circulated by the early church as precious items because they were apostolic interpretations of, of what went on. So the Gospels tell you what happened, and the letters tell you why it happened and what the significance of it is. Of those 21, 14, we believe, were written by Paul. I say we believe because there's one that is deliberately unsigned, and there's a strategy behind doing that. And we'll talk about when we get to the book of Hebrews. We're among those. Some scholars have different perspectives, but we think it's, we have a, a good defendable position by arguing that the book of Hebrews was written by Paul, but deliberately unsigned, so it, wouldn't, so it would be read, so it wouldn't be, rise ire and so forth. But in any case, uh, we have seven by Paul, and, I mean 14 by Paul, and then seven by some of the others, Peter, James, we call them the Hebrew Christian epistles. So there's 21 epistles. So we have five historical books, 21 letters that are sort of like the op-ed pieces, if you will. And then we have, in lieu of the prophets of the Old Testament, we have the book of Revelation by uh, Apostle John. So, that, so we have 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. That's 66 books. And people say, that's sort of strange. Everybody expects 70 books. Why 66? Well, te technically, the book of Psalms is five books, by the way. So if you put that in, it's really 70, but let's not confuse people. Everybody knows it as 66 books. Okay. So the Old Testament was compiled over several thousand years. That shocks many people because there are books in the Old Testament that are older than the books of Moses. The main example being Job. Because Job was an old book even before, before Moses. So uh, they span a period of at least 1,500, let's, uh, almost probably 2,000 years in compiling the Old Testament, pulled together as we know it today in the days of Ezra. In the days of Ezra. And uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the documentation there because Jesus Christ authenticated it for us. He quotes from it, quotes from each of the books, and so we don't have a problem because he felt comfortable enough to quote from it as God's Word, that should be enough for us too. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But the New Testament's a little different kind of a creature. It was put together within one lifetime. Whole different uh, circumstance. We have four Gospels, and I say Luke in two volumes. Uh, and I'm treating here the book of Acts as you know, Luke volume two, so to speak. The Pauline corpus of letters and other epistles. And these were all circulated uh, along with the Septuagint Old Testament. Now get the picture here. The Old Testament, which was written originally in Hebrew, was translated into Greek three centuries before the Gospel period because most of the people in the world, commercial world, spoke Greek. As the Christian church begins to emerge in that first century, their Old Testament was a copy of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The LXX abbreviation is, is the Greek version of the Old Testament. Most of the quotes in the New Testament of the Old, when the, in, the New, in the New Testament when they qu quote the Old Testament, they quote most of the time from the Septuagint, the, the Greek. And so the Gospels, these letters, and the Septuagint was a package that was used for instruction and for worship within the early church. Something that most people don't factor into their thinking well enough is both Luke and Paul rely on the fact that their readers were contemporary with these events. 
when Paul writes to the Corinthians, many of them in the congregation were up in Galilee and saw the resurrected Lord. There were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. That's one reason they don't have to argue hard for it, because they, they experienced it. And uh, Paul and, and Luke both rely on uh, uh, contemporary testimony. There's something else that's always instructive as a student to pay attention to what's missing, not only what's there. There are some very conspicuous events in history that are not mentioned in the New Testament. For one, Nero's persecutions after 64 AD. Nero, see up till then, most of the persecutions of the Christians came from the Jewish community by zealous Jews. In fact, one of the things, one of the points that Luke makes, not only in his gospel, but also in, his, in the book of Acts, that's why we believe, many of us suspect, that the, the Luke, the, uh, volume 1 and volume 2, were the necessary documentation for an appeal to Caesar. We know from the Roman laws that if you appeal to Caesar, the, the facts surrounding your background had to precede you to Rome. In those days, that was an expensive project, because they didn't have printing and copying. It was a, putting a document together was an expensive process. And... Uh, but you notice, as you, if you read Luke carefully, the centurions are always good guys. And he goes out to some lengths to point out that the, the uprisings that occurred wherever Paul went were by the Jewish community, not, not persecuted by Rome. That was a development that came with Nero and following, the, the persecutions by Rome. Well, it's interesting, that started in 64 AD. No mention of that. The execution of the leader of the Jerusalem church, James, who led the council in Acts 15. He gets ex executed in 62 A.D. That's well documented. It's interesting that's not alluded to in any of the New Testament documents. What does this tell you? That the New Testament documents were completed before these things happened. This is a way of putting an early dating on the document, especially when some of these things would have been incorporated in their arguments. The Jewish revolt against the Romans in 66 A.D. No mention. The destruction of the temple is the most telling one of all in 70 A.D. The fact that that's not mentioned. So this is strong documentation demonstrating that the documents that make up the New Testament were drafted and in circulation prior to any of these events. In other words, they were circulated prior to 62 AD. And uh, uh, we'll get to more of that. Now there is a parchment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Dead Sea stuff and all that, that uh, but there, there is a parchment. It's, it was published for a while under the label of the Jesus Papyri. That's just a, a secular uh, label for a book that was written about it. But there was some scraps, a little segment of uh, text of Matthew's Gospel. And uh, it, was, it, uh, it had been found in Egypt, and it was, it, it was at, the, in, uh, at the Magdalene School of uh, Oxford. And... Uh, there are three fragments. They're written on both sides, which tells you that th this was a codex. The, the, the ancient uh, um, Old Testament was written on scrolls. That's why I always use the little idiom of scrolls. When I talk Old Testament, I use a little scrap of parchment. It, it, to, as we go through these slides, I use a different background so you to make you conscious of what came from the Old and New, Te uh, New Testament. A codex was started to emerge when they discovered it was useful to write on parchment on both sides and make pages like in a book. A codex is what you and I think of as a book in contrast to a scroll, which has, you know, a scroll has two, two rolls and you, you, a scroll is a scroll. Okay. Uh, codexes are handy because you've got pages. You can quickly get at page 237. You don't have to wind your, you know, through a scroll. So codexes became, started to emerge in this period about the time of the first church. And it's interesting that this is already, the fact that these Scraps are written on both sides, indicate they were a codex, not in a scroll. And there's three fragments written on both sides. There's about a total of 24 lines. They appear to be a segment of Matthew chapter 26, verses 23 on one side, 31 on the other. Something else that'll be important as we get a little further, they also conform their, to what we understand from Textus Receptus, and I'll come to that later in a minute here. But some advanced technology comes to our rescue. And uh, it turns out that... Uh, a scanning laser microscope can differentiate between 20 millionths of a meter layers of the papyrus. They can measure the height and depth of the ink as well as the angle of the stylus. They can tell whether the writer was right or left-handed. See, the technology today is astonishing. Well, 
using these advanced technologies, um, it turns out that a Dr. Karsten Thede, using a scanner laser microscope and comparing with four other manuscripts, and I won't go through the details of the other four manuscripts, the more important thing, what he's done from his studies, he's concluded that the, the uh, Magdalene papyrus is either an original of Matthew's Gospel or an immediate copy. It was written while Matthew and the other disciples and other eyewitnesses were still alive. The point I'm making is, you will find in your Bible helps many estimates of when certain books are dated. But you'll discover if you do your homework that the current scholarship is substantiating the dates far earlier than was previously believed. Many people are in the impression that the New Testament was put together in the 2nd century A.D. and so forth. That's nonsense. We're discovering that many of these things are contemporaneous. They were circulated before 60 A.D. And some of these are dated in the, uh, in the 50s. So it's a, uh, this is within a decade or two of the events. Now of the four Gospels, this isn't that important, but there's obviously a lot of material that's in common to all of them. Um, um, Matthew is larger than the others because Matthew took shorthand, and I'll come to that in a minute. But uh, uh, Mark and, and Matthew are very similar, but the, the common material is shown here. John has the largest non-common material. John and, and, uh, uh, it speaks uh, especially of the Judean ministry rather than the Galilean ministry, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Now in terms of linguistics, a common language is Aramaic, but the, uh, Jesus also spoke Greek. We find occasions of both. He spoke initially Greek to Mary until He addressed her in Aramaic where she recognizes who He was. She thought He was the gardener, and she says, Mary, and she recognized Rabboni. Gives him, uh, uh, we'll talk about that when we get to John 20. Um, Pilate, he, he impresses me. Pilate personally could write in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Pilate labeled the titlon on the cross. And he played a word game against the Jews, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But he, part of it was in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and he wrote it himself. As a, a uh, top official, he had skill in all three. Hebrew, because he was ruling the Hebrew, Hebrew territory. He spoke Greek, because that was the common commercial language. And Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire. So it, it gets more prevalent use later, of course. Now there are some syntactic peculiarities um, in the New Testament. The sentence structure is really Hebrew more than Aramaic. Mark quotes Luke in hundreds of places. That shatters many people's concept here. You think of Luke as a Johnny come lately, because so much of what he learned, he learned by doing some research. But Mark quotes Luke, which means Luke's document was in place very early. Mark is basically the sec secretary for Peter. When Mark speaks, he's really speaking, speaking for Peter. He did the writing for Peter, apparently. Mark quotes Acts in 150 places. It's ast astonishing to realize the book of Acts was uh, uh, that early. And it's also clear from Mark that he knew Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, Colossians, and James. These letters of uh, both Paul and also of James. And uh, there are 600 evidences of an early date for Luke. That shatters a lot. I'm mentioning nothing to the, they're that important per se, except they will, they will contradict some of the traditional myths that have surrounded the New Testament. There is a school of belief among scholars, they call it the Jerusalem School, for reasons I won't bother you to hear it, that originally there were Hebrew drafts, out of which about 40-45 came a rough Greek version, and then probably from that some Greek and Aramaic versions, sometimes called the Q documents. But in any case, out of all of this, we have a Greek adaptation by subject, which leads to Luke first, Mark next, and then probably Matthew, but Matthew drawing directly from the Hebrew, for lots of reasons. And then, of course, John is a whole other act on the thing, about, probably about we're dealing here, but we're dealing here within a, just a few decades of the actual events. And so just to give you a perspective. Paul's letters, the, pr the first letter he probably wrote were, uh, uh, were the Thessalonian letters. And we'll deal with those separately in a special way, not, uh, not because they're first, but because they have some topical issues that we're going to deal with later. First, Cor first Corinthian letter was about the spring of 55. There were actually four letters to Cor Corinth. We only have two of them remaining. And then the first, Tim Tim first Timothy, first letter of Timothy was about fall of 55. Second Corinthians was about 56. And you get the general feeling. Most of these were anyway between 50 and 58 uh, as the letters. And uh, uh, other New Testament books are roughly in the same domain in the 50s to 60s, and we won't quibble with the details here. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the English Bible. This is very I important to understand. The Old Testament uh, originals were sometimes referred to as the Vorlaga. And for us, the important event was the translation of the Vorlaga into Greek. Uh, 
uh, three centuries before the Gospel period. And we don't spend a lot of time on the background of that because Jesus authenticated the New Testament for us. I mean, the Old Testament for us by, uh, by His quotes and so forth. But I want you to be conscious of the fact that that was several centuries before the Gospel period. Okay. Now, the, the Hebrews, the, 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 the Jewish uh, leadership, got really upset in the first century because they discovered the Septuagint, the Greek translation, had been adopted by the Christians as their Bible. So they had the Council of Yamnia where they had a real problem to solve because Judaism relies on sacrifices. There is no remission of sins without sacrifices. They have no place to sacrifice. The temple's been destroyed. So what they in effect are faced with doing is redefining Judaism. That comes out of the, the Council of Yamnia. And, uh, but they also, out of that council, set the groundwork for what later becomes the, Ma- the Masoretic text. You're, you're, when you look at a Hebrew Old Testament, you're reading probably the Masoretic text, and that's uh, 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 out of, uh, it derived from the Council of Yamnia. Now, what also get, starts to emerge here is a group of documents that are called Textus Receptus, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go on here. Um, Textus Receptus, about the end of the third century, Lucian of Antioch compiled the Greek text to become the primary standard throughout the Byzantine world. Now something you need to understand is that the center of the world was not Rome anymore. It had been moved. Constantine moved it to Byzantium. All these councils, church councils you read out and so forth, are not in Latin. They're in Greek and they're in the east. They're, they're, the, the Byzantium was the capital of the world. And uh, the Greek text that was circulated widely throughout the Byzantine world is a text that is returned, re, uh, referred to as Textus Receptus. The received text is what it's intended to con- connote. And by the sixth, from the 6th through the 14th century, the majority of New Testament texts are produced in Byzantium in Greek. So it was the primary publication center of the Christian world. In 1525, now we're moving way ahead in the 16th century, Erasmus, using five or six of the Byzantine manuscripts, compiled the first Greek text produced on a printing press, thanks to Gutenberg. This was the big event that really led to the Reformation, was to make Bibles available. And uh, and his writings are the basis for what is formally called Textus Receptus. And uh, so that gives you a feeling for the timing here. And... uh, out of this we have the Old Latin and then the Vulgate. Jerome does the Latin translation of the Bible, which becomes, uh, with Tyndale and others, uh, m- translate to make the English Bible. Uh, and that's really what the one we're dealing with. I won't take you through the evolution of, from Wycliffe and all the rest from 1382 down through 1611, the King James Version, except to make a couple of points here. As we go through these Erasmus and the Tyndale Bible, Luther's Bible, Coverdale's, and, and so forth, and the Geneva Bible and the rest. You need to understand that the people that did these translations did it under penalty of death. It was a capital crime to be trafficking in Bibles by the medieval church. So these heroes were, that became martyrs uh, did, uh, did all this out of their commitment to get the Word of God out to the people so they could understand it, rather than have it filtered by a, 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 a church with its own agenda. And so... Uh, uh, but you finally get down to the King James Version from which all of us, all of us are indebted. King James VI of Scotland became King of England, and he called himself James I. And in 1607, with more than 50 scholars, they met in continual prayer and committees. The one thing that really distinguishes them, they were committed believers. They, weren't, uh, they were believers first and scholars second in that sense of speaking. Something else you should understand when they did the King James Version, they had available to them 5,556 manuscripts. So they had plenty of ammunition. The primary reliance of the uh, the translation committee was on Textus Receptus. That was their their yardstick. And what they produced is the King James Version of the Bible. And... uh, it has been heralded even by the secular world as one of the most noblest monument in English prose. The majesty of the King James has never been really equaled. And some of us have trouble with the old English, but that it turns out with there's less than a dozen words that bother you, and you can learn those pretty quickly. As you get comfortable with it, uh, many of us uh, find, uh, still find the King James the most comfortable version because of its majesty, frankly. 
every translation has its problems. The advantage of the King James, the problems are well known and well documented. And most Bible helps key to that anyway. Some of the new translations have problems too, but they're less, no, less well known. So, okay, there's something else, as you realize, the King James Version leans on Tyndale and the forebears, but it leans most heavily on Textus Receptus as they translate it into English. But I want to talk about another set of codexes or codices, the Alexandrian. There's the Codex Alexandrinus that was discovered about 1630 and was brought to England. It's a 5th century manuscript containing the, almost, almost the entire New Testament. There was also Codex Sinaiticus. About 200 years later, a German scholar named Constantine Montisendorf discovered Codex Sinaiticus at St. Catherine's Monastery at the traditional Mount Sinai. This manuscript is apparently dated about 350 A.D. So it's one of the two oldest manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. Okay? And there's also Codex Vaticanus. It had been in the Vatican Library since at least 1481, but was not made available to scholars until the middle of the 19th century. It was dated slightly earlier, like about 325 A.D., than Codex Sinaiticus, and is regarded by many as the, one of the most reliable copies of the Greek New Testament. Now what's going to happen here, to look ahead a little bit, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus have been overly revered by scholars to our detriment. And I, uh, I'll explain what happened here, but you need to, because they are very old manuscripts, they tended in the, modern of some, in the minds of some of the modern translators to have extra weight because they're older. And that turns out to be a trap, and I'll come into that. These, these tra- the Alexandrian codices have become very controversial in recent years for a number of reasons. So these occur in about the 3rd or 4th century, and they become the primary reliance of the newest, most modern translations. The NIV and many of the other new translations tend to lean very heavily on these Alexandrian codices. Uh, and th- so tex- the, the, the uh, primacy of Textus Receptus has been dethroned. In about the 1730s, a guy by the name of Bengal produced a text that deviated from Textus Receptus, and he relied on some of these earlier manuscripts. And Carl Lockman did a similar kind of thing, and another guy did. Uh, not that critical. The real important guys are two characters known by as Westcott and Hort. Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort were Anglican churchmen who had contempt for Textus Receptus. And they leaned especially heavy on these Alexandrian codices. They began a work in 1853 that resulted after 28 years with a Greek New Testament based on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. The problem is we've now discovered that those texts, even though they're older, are corrupted. And these people have really promoted it, and uh, we should talk a little bit about them. Both of these guys were very influenced by Origen and others who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. And they embraced the prevalent Gnostic heresies of the period from the headquarters of the Gnostics, which is Alexandria. The codexes we're talking about came from Alexandria. Alexandria was the fountainhead of the Gnostics, which were anti, really in effect, anti-Christian groups. Much of the New Testament letters are written in repudiation of the Gnostic beliefs. So we discover upon more careful examination that these codices that they're relying on, while they're excellent Greek scholars, are corrupted texts. And so this is one of the reasons you'll notice if you've been following Bible things in the last few decades, there's been a reaction against the modern translations by some who begin to realize that they're victims, in a sense, of, corru- of, of corrupted uh, foundations here. There are over 3,000 contradictions in the four Gospels alone between the manuscripts. They change the traditional Greek text in over 8,000 places. And uh, Now, by the way, Westcott and Hort, although they're very, very obviously outstanding Greek scholars, you wouldn't trust them to run your, you wouldn't trust them to teach your Sunday school class. They did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. So you've got to be on alert. Just because a guy has a lot of degrees and a lot of prominence in the scholastic community does not make him a bona fide expert in the, in the, in, in, in before the Lord. And so... Uh, in any case, we now have a question mark on Alexandrian codices, which means that puts a cloud on some of the modern translations. They're useful because they're readable, but be careful if you're doing caref- a, a d- detailed study because they've been corrupted. Now, what were the Gnostic heresies? Okay, I think it's Satan's strategy, the same one he had in Genesis 3. What did he do? He put doubt and then additions and amendments. Did God really say that? 
Well, this is maybe what he really meant. That's the kind, that's where you start going down one of these alleyways that gets you into trouble. In about 55 AD, the twisting of the scripture begins. That's what 2 Peter chapter 2 deals with. That's what 1 John 1 deals with. They're dealing with the Gnostic heresies. And uh, so the, the Gnostics disparaged the existing writings. They mixed in Greek philosophy and concepts along with the revelation of God. In other words, if you look at the Gnostics, add to it some pantheism and all these other things. So they, that's why they, 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 uh, they, they deal, if, if you're really in the know, you don't take those things seriously. Let, the, let us let you know how, what it really like. It's that kind of deception that's going on. So what the Gnostics did, they expurgated the Scriptures. The Gnostics were known for mutilating the Scriptures. They would throw out the verses that weren't comfortable. And uh, in 156, Irenaeus said of the Gnostics, Wherefore they and their followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the Scriptures, which they themselves have shortened. So we have evidence that that was one of the things, one of the tactics they used. The headquarter for the Gnostics, of course, was Alexandria, which is the primary library center of the world at the time. Now let me, we could spend a lot of time wading through scholastic arguments about the texts. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you a shortcut. I'm going to show you a shortcut. There are, in the Scripture, there are authentication codes. There's an automatic security monitor watching over every single letter of the text that doesn't rust or wear out and it's been running continually for several thousand years and most people don't know about it. There is a fingerprint, what I call a fingerprint signature of the author in the Scripture and we'll show you that. And furthermore, this authentication code is of a non-compromisable design. Now, if you're an engineer, your mouth is watering. Boy, where is this thing? I want to see this thing. Let me back up a little bit now and give you some background. How many of you have noticed there are sevens in the Bible? Anybody without their hand up hasn't read their Bible, right? You know, over 600 passages have it very explicitly so. Some of these are very overt. It's very obvious. Seven of this and seven of that or whatever. Some of them are structural. Someone will list a few things. You'll always notice there's always seven of them. You find those. They're subtle. Some are not only subtle, some are actually hidden. And yet you can find them if you know how to look. The, I'm going to suggest to you the possibility that these heptatic structures are a signature of the Creator Himself. And let's take a look at some examples. I want you to imagine, you don't have to actually do this, but I want you to imagine yourself seriously taking this on an assignment. Imagine yourself taking on a scratch pad, blank piece of paper, and I want you to design a family tree a genealogy. And by the way, for this assignment, you can do this from fiction. You can make it up as you go. How many could do that? Obviously you could. Okay, that's, that's, no, that's no problem. You know, fathers and sons, make up a family tree. Okay. Except I got a couple of rules I want you to follow. When, when you finished your assignment, you turn it in. I want the number of words that you used to be an exact multiple of seven. In other words, if I take the total number of words that in, is in your uh, uh, work product, if I divide it by seven, I don't have any remainder. So it's either seven words, 14, 21, 28. In other words, whatever number of words you use, it's an exact multiple of seven. How many could do that? You could fudge it around to multiple of seven. Right? Good, yeah, sure you could. Of course you could. I've got another rule I want to add. I want the number of letters that you use to also be an exact multiple of seven. I can sense that some of you have dropped out. You say that, that you begin to realize that's a little tricky. And it's the thing, I'm talking about in English here, aren't I? English, you can fudge around sometimes. You can, poets always do that. You, know, you throw an asterisk in or something. Okay. There's an, I want the number of vowels and the number of consonants to be divisible by seven exactly. If I go through all your words, I count the vowels, it's an exact multiple. Of seven. You got a problem with that? Of course you do. You realize that to make it a multiple of seven, if it's a random result, you've got six chances of losing and only one of winning. If I haven't come out right. You with me? So every time I add a rule, it makes it tougher. I'm going to say I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. Well, that's kind of a chicken. And obviously, if that's the number of words begin with a consonant, must be divisible by seven. The number of words that occur more than once to be divisible by seven. Do you, anybody still playing? You get the feeling that this would be hard to do, right? Those that occur in more than one form divisible by seven. Those that occur in only one form to be divisible by seven. 
The number of nouns shall be divisible by seven. The number only seven words shall not be nouns. That's easy, probably, maybe not. The number of names shall be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns shall be permitted beside names. The number of male names shall be divisible by seven, and the number of generations shall be divisible by seven. You probably guessed where I'm headed here. Because this is a description of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 18 verses of the book of Matthew. And, in, and incidentally, we're talking about the Greek, not the Hebrew or English. In English, it's soft. You can fudge around. Greek is incredibly precise. Every verb has to meet five conditions and so forth. It's a tight, precise language. And what I'm sharing with you here, of course, is the discoveries of Dr. Ivan Panin. He's a very interesting guy, born in Russia in 1855. He was exiled in early age. He got tangled up in a plot against the Tsar. He eventually emigrated to Germany and then finally to the United States. He graduated from Harvard in 1882 with a PhD in mathematics. But then he discovered Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, every one of us in this room that has discovered Jesus Christ, whether you know it or not, is a result of a miracle wrought by someone's prayer. For some of you, the stories are really quite dramatic. For many of us, it's quite routine. But every one of us that accept Christ are a result of a miracle. But if you're a PhD from Harvard, that's a miracle indeed. Okay? So. But shortly after becoming a Christian, he discovered this ha- these heptatic structures, these sevenfold structures that underlie the biblical text. He discovered that about 1890. He committed the rest of his life, more than 50 years, generating over 43,000 pages, writing incidentally in very small letters. He's got a very tight hand uh, of discoveries. He went to his Lord on October 30th of 1942 and left behind all kinds of, of uh, discoveries. Candidly, it's very tedious to go through because it's laborious stuff, and yet what comes out of this are some treasures, and I'll show you a few highlights. That was the one that I showed you. The, the genealogy of Jesus Christ fits all those conditions. And even if you try to simulate that, you'll discover it's almost impossible to get something to fit all those conditions. But let's talk about a specific practical example. If you look at your Bible, at the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, you will probably find a footnote in it. Something to the effect that these verses are in dispute and were probably added later by some copyist. That's the typical kind of remark you see, annotating the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, the question is, uh, were they added later? Or, you know, Westcott and Hort um, regards the last part of Mark, that's verses uh, 9 through 20 of chapter 16, as a later addition, that this wasn't in the original, it was added by well, some well-intended copyist down the road a bit. Well, that's easily shredded because Irenaeus in 150 A.D. quotes it in his commentary. The, 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 the uh, Alexandrian codices were 4th century, but in the 1st and 2nd century we have quotes from uh, these so-called verses that were added later. No, they weren't added later. They were expurgated from the Alexandrian codices, is my contention. So Irenaeus either had a copy of the original, or he must have been clairvoyant. I don't think he was clairvoyant. Hippolytus, in the, also in the second century, quotes from these twelve verses. And these are several hundred years before the Alexandrian codices. So if these verses are not in the Alexandrian codices, they were expurgated. So you can attack this scholarship from the point of view of historical records, but I'm going to show you something even more surprising. If we studied the last 12 verses of Mark, we discover that verses 9 to 11 are an appearance to Mary, and and, and it discusses the the disciples' initial disbelief. From verse 11 to 18 are subsequent appearances, and then the conclusion of the chapter is verses 19 to 20. So from 9 to 20 is what we're talking about. Another way to to organize those uh, 12 verses, is from verses 9 to 14 a simple narrative, verses 15 to 18 is a discourse by Jesus Christ, and the last two verses are a conclusion of the whole gospel. And by the way, if you take these 12 verses away, you leave the gospels with the people confused and in disarray and in disbelief. You have no resurrection. So you can see why the Gnostics would love to drop those verses off. But anyway, these are the verses that are there. Let me share some things with you that Panin discovered about these verses. The number of words in these 12 verses are 175. That's a multiple of seven exactly. 
Oh, really? The vocabulary involved is 98 different words. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The number of letters in the 12 verses are 553. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The vowels are a multiple of seven exactly. The consonants, obviously, would be a multiple of seven exactly. The total vocabulary, I said, was 98 words. 84 of those are found earlier in the book of Mark. That's a multiple of seven exactly. 14 of these words are found only here. It's a multiple of seven exactly. 42 of those words are used in the Lord's address. 56 are not part of his, uh, were not part of his vocabulary that are in, the, in, this, in these 12 verses. All multiples of seven exactly. Now, I've, if I take just two, two rules, if I have one rule, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? To meet two rules, it's seven squared. In other words, I have 40 eight chances of losing, and only one of having both rules of seven. You follow me? It goes by the square, right? Two rules is the square. For three rules, it's the cube of that. 340, I'd have 343 chances of losing for every one of winning. And so it goes. For four rules, it's 24 or one. I've given you so far nine rules. So the ch- the, the, you have one chance, if, if this is a random process, you have one chance in 40 million of coming out okay. You see, how, see it, it, the more rules you add, the more restrictive it becomes. Would you like to try this, by the way? Now, if, assume you worked eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, for 50 weeks a year. That means you've got about 2,000 uh, productive hours per year, and you put those in minutes, that's 120,000 minutes per year. You've got seven to nine chances to try this randomly, 40 million attempts. Let's assume it takes you 10 minutes to do a draft. And if it doesn't work, it takes another 10 minutes to draw another draft. Well, then in that case, it would take you about 3,362 years to come up with that design. And, uh, but by the way, it gets worse. Um, I said there were 175 words, 56 in the address of the Lord, uh, 119 in the rest of the passage. In the, in the introductory verses, it was 35. Each one of these is a multiple of seven exactly. In other words, uh, in the various groupings of the, uh, uh, the natural divisions of the passage, you'll find it's always a multiple of seven exactly. And uh, it goes on and on. I won't badger this more than you need to hear. There's something else you need to know about both Hebrew and Greek. They're distinctive in that each letter has a numerical value, and it, it is relevant that way. And here's a list of the Greek words. The, uh, the alpha is worth one, the beta two, gamma three, and so forth, right on through uh, to the end. And uh, this is this, the use of numerical values of letters is called gametria. There's a geometrical value. Every word thus has a numerical value. The numerical or geometrical value of this, the total geometrical value of the passage happens to be 106,663, which is a multiple of seven exactly. Try doing that by accident. And if you take each one of these natural groupings, you'll discover each one has a geometrical value of a multiple of seven exactly. The first word, the middle word, the last word, and so forth. And it goes on and on, uh, as you can imagine here. Um, I said we have a vocabulary of 98 words, 14 not before in Mark, 7 found later in the New Testament, uh, 35 occurrences, um, and uh, the uh, numerical value of them, again, is a multiple of seven exactly. Uh, the, uh, the verse 20 of vocabulary is 14. Uh, it, it goes on and on uh, in, in terms of words found here previously, words not found. Everything's a multiple of seven exactly. The total forms is 133. The value of those are 89,663, which is a multiple of seven exactly. Those that occur more than once is 112, which is a multiple of seven. Occurring more than once is 21, a multiple of seven. Occurring 63 times, which itself is a multiple of seven. And we could go on and on like this. There's a word here that's an unusual word because it occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. It has a numerical value of 581, which is a multiple of seven exactly. And it's preceded by 42 vocabulary words and in, uh, in the passage by 126. All these are multiples of seven exactly. Now I've gone, I've added a lot on here. We started out with just nine rules. I've just given you 34 of them. What's the chance of these rules having happened by just random chance? Well, let's take a look at that. That's uh, 7 to the 34th power which is roughly 5 times 10 to the 28th tries would be needed. Now, you've already had enough experience with, large, with powers of 10 to realize these are big numbers. 
let's assume you'd like to try to simulate this, and I'll let you have a computer to help you, okay? There are about 3 times 10 to the 7th seconds per year. And I'm going to give you a computer that can do 400 million tries per second. Okay? That's a pretty pretty good machine. And uh, that means it would take about 4 times 10 to the 8th tries per second. It would take about 4.3 million million computer years. Or put it another way, I would need 1 million uh, supercomputers working 4.3 4.3 million years to obtain this result by randomness. By randomness. So this is, this is again, and by the way, I've just used 34, 34 conditions here. Panin identified 75 of them. So you can say some of those are, in, are not independent of each other. That's true. So two or three of those actually derive one from the other. Okay, throw those out. i got 75 to pick from. The New Testament, let me show you some other things that Pannon discovered. The New Testament consists of 27 books, right? That means there's an opening and closing word to each of the 27 books. It begins and ends with a word, right? So 2 times 27, that means there's 54 words, right? Among those 54 words is a total vocabulary of 28 words that are multiple of 7 exactly. In the Gospels alone, there's multiple of 7 exactly. The total geometrical value of those words is also a multiple of 7 exactly. The value of the shortest word, which is one letter, is 70, and it's a multiple of 7, obviously. The value of the longest word is a multiple of 7. And this one's particularly interesting. The longest word happens to be apocalypsis. And it happens to be 7 times 6 times 6 times 6. That's kind of interesting, I think. This is the one I love. I I, I realize we're hitting a lot lot of these things. It it, uh, may be overkill here. But I want to show you the one that blows me away completely. We've discovered the vocabulary in the Greek that's unique to Matthew. Uh, now understand what I'm talking about. The vocabulary that's unique. These are words that only Matthew uses. If you go through the whole Bible, take all the words, there are 42, uh, there, there's a vocabulary that's unique to Matthew. It occurs only 42 times. It's a multiple of seven exactly. And those have 126 letters. A multiple of seven exactly. Now what makes this pr- particularly Uh, peculiar, is let's assume for discussion that Matthew tried to do this on purpose. How would you do that? If you were Matthew and you decided you would like to have this characteristic in your gospel, how would you go about making sure that the words that you alone use is a multiple of seven exactly? Well, you can only do it two ways. You've got to sit down with all the other writers of the New Testament, assuming you can figure out who they're going to be, and get them to agree not to use your little list of words. How many think that happened? Not very likely. Or you could argue that this feature is an argument that Matthew wrote last. Because in theory, at least, he could lay down everybody else's writings and make sure that it fit. So you could use this as an argument that Matthew wrote his gospel last. He either had prior agreement, that doesn't make sense, or his gospel was written last. Okay, the gospel of Matthew has a vocabulary unique to itself that's a multiple of seven exactly. But so does Mark. Well, I thought Matthew wrote last. No, Mark wrote last, because Mark also has a vocabulary unique to him that's a multiple of seven exactly. But so does Luke. And so does John. They each were written last. And obviously I'm being facetious. And so did James, Peter, Jude, and Paul. Each one was written last. In other words, each one has a vocabulary that nobody else uses that happens to be an exact multiple of seven. There's only one explanation for this that uh, that I can tolerate mathematically, and that is that the Holy Spirit was an overseer of every word, every letter in the New Testament. I think that's exciting. By the way, this even bridges the Old New Testaments. You know, I often joke that I'm going to have a t- I'm going to have a conference and have an advertised conference. We're going to tear out the page of the Bible tonight that's unnecessary. That'll smoke out all the fundamentalists, right? And then very ceremoniously open the Bible and tear out the page between the Old and New Testament because it's unnecessary. There are words that have this heptatic feature if and only if you put the Old and New Testament together. The word hallelujah occurs 24 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New. Four plus 24 is 28, a multiple of seven exactly. Hosanna, shepherd, Jehovah Sabaoth. And I go through a list of these words. 
that are not multiples of seven in either Old and New Testament, but they are a multiple of seven when you put the Old and New Testament together. I think that's kind of fun. All this, of course, is detailed in our briefing package called How We Got Our Bible. But the main point is these specifications that we talked about have been fulfilled. The specifications in the Bible says that He would be born of a virgin, and He was. That He would be born in Bethlehem, and He was. That He would be taken into Egypt, and He was. That He would heal the sick and make people whole, and He did. And each one of these is documented. You can look up the verses. He would be crucified, and He was. That He would die for our sins, and He did. That He would be raised from the dead, and He was. And uh, so, why do we accept the Bible? Because these little numbers from canon? No, 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 that's not the reason. We do this because it's the authentication of Jesus Christ. The Septuagint has over 300 detailed specifications He's fulfilled in His lifetimes. The 70 weeks prophecy that we studied in Daniel chapter 9 is undeniable. So we have the authentication of who Christ is, first of all. The Scripture authenticates who Christ was. Then we can lean on the authentication by Christ of the Torah, of Daniel, in fact of the whole Old Testament. It's an integrated design. That's our apologetic. That's the one that's bulletproof. That this, these 66 books penned by over 40 different guys over virtually 2,000 years is an integrated package and that it transcends the dimensionality of time itself. No other book on the planet Earth does that. 66 separate books by penned by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other over several thousand years. Their design anticipates in detail events before they happen. So they obviously the source of this message is from outside our physical universe, outside our time domain. There are all kinds of hidden authentication codes in the Scripture. We've talked about some of the microcodes, these little numbers and so forth. There are also macro codes. We went through Genesis chapter 5 and the fact that we have the, the uh, summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in the genealogy in the Torah of all places. We have the macro codes. We looked at those in Genesis 5, Genesis 22, the Akita, the book of Ruth, the whole book of Joshua, and of course the transcendent numerical design that we've touched on here, just as we go along the way. But there is something else. How can you personally say, Jack, I don't, I'm not a mathematician. I don't want to get into all that stuff. But how can I know? How can you know? And Jesus answers that for you in John 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's Christ's challenge to you. Try him and see for yourself. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And once you begin to discover that, once you begin to discover the integrity of the package, it'll change your whole perspective on everything that it says when you know you can rely on it. And uh, so we, we've, uh, we're going to now enter, in the next session, we'll actually enter the New Testament. We'll talk about the, uh, the obviously, we'll enter the historical books, the Gospels. And uh, the interpretive letters will come separately in Revelation. Along the way, we'll do some summaries. We'll have a whole eschatological summary or, of where end time prophecy is headed and so forth. Much of that will be controversial. Different good scholars have different views on some of these things. But in the New Testament, we have the five historical books. And next time, we'll focus on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to take a little different approach. With a limited uh, opportunity we have, we're not going to go through each book individually. We'll, go at, we'll talk about its distinctives first. But then we'll go through an integration of all of them geographically. Here's where he went, there's what he did, and we'll put it all together for you geographically when we do that. And uh, one of the things that uh, you'll learn that's kind of fun is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have a different agenda. Matthew's a Jew. He presents Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Messiah, the promised Messiah. He's Jewish, very Jewish. Mark is really writing for Peter, but his emphasis is to present Jesus Christ as the suffering servant, the obedient to the Father. Luke's a different kind of guy altogether. Luke's a doctor. He's interested in presenting in Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. The fact that God became man is what blew him away. And John is the, takes the flip side of that, that he's the Son of God. Each one of these has a distinctive mission as he writes his gospel, and you'll discover something interesting. Everything in their respective Gospels supports that particular emphasis. Um, the genealogy, 
Matthew, being a Jew, starts his genealogy from Abraham and takes it through the legal line, through Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ. Mark is a servant not interested in pedigree. He's the only one without a, without a, a, a genealogy. Luke, because he's the son of man, he obviously starts with Adam. And we, from Adam to Abraham, when he gets to Abraham to David, they're both the same, Matthew and, and Luke. But when you get to David, Luke takes a left turn. He doesn't go through the first surviving son of Bathsheba as, as Matthew does. He goes through the second surviving son, down through a line that ends up with Mary. And uh, so he has the, so the bloodline. And that, there's a whole thing we'll get into when we get there. That, there's some fascinating mysteries behind all that. And John has a genealogy, but most people wouldn't recognize it. The first few verses is the genealogy of the pre-existent one. And uh, you can take a look at that and see what he says there. So Matthew emphasizes what Jesus said. Mark, what Jesus did. Luke, what Jesus felt. He's the humanist of the bunch. And uh, John, who he was. That's his emphasis. So Matthew writes to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek, John to the church. The first miracle... Matthew, the first name would be a leper cleanse. That's a very Jewish emphasis. Leprosy was a symbol of sin. Mark and Luke, both being Gentile or, or oriented, uh, demons expelled. John's the mystic. Water turned to wine is his first miracle in each one. It, the, the, uh, Matthew ends with the resurrection, as any Jew would. Mark with the ascension. Luke with the promise of the Spirit, setting up his sequel, which is Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and then. John, of course, the promise of his return for the church, of course. And John finishes that, sets himself up for revelation, if you will. And so it's interesting uh, when we study the camps and numbers, the east, west, south, uh, and north had symbols. The ensign for Judah was the lion, right? And the uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark was the, uh, the, uh, the west, the next one was the Ephraim, the, uh, the, the ox, if you will. And uh, uh, Luke, the man, the Reuben, was as simple as a man, and Dan, uh, the eagle. So we have the face of the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle that those tri- those, that camp represented, the same as the face of the, ser- uh, ser- uh, the seraphim and the cherubim at, around the throne of God, fits the four Gospels. And you begin to realize there is a mystical overseer on how these things are designed. And uh, so that's kind of, I think, kind of fun. And there's also different styles in terms of groupings and snapshots and so forth. We'll talk about all that next time. So that's what we're about. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Fun time coming. We'll be going through an overview of the life of Christ where we'll put that all together up to the final week. We'll s- save a whole session for the final week because there's, there's, there's an awful lot of there that Mel Gibson didn't tell you or couldn't tell you. We'll talk about that. And uh, I believe he did us a wonderful favor with this marvelous piece of work because he's given us the opportunity to open a conversation with anybody. But there are some things that he wasn't in a position to be able to communicate that we will extract from the text as we go forward. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We pray, Father, that you would take these seeds that are planted in our lives. We pray, Father, that you'd nurse them to fruition. We pray, Father, that you'd illuminate that path before us that we each might know what you would have of us as we go forward as we just commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.